I need food. Go get food. I'm going to start this this series, this not series, <laughs> this lecture or discussion on Haugen's principle. Okay. Why? Why am I doing this? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I use Haugen's principle actually, not in a direct sense, but sort of as a guide to be thinking about the physics of my system. Um, when I'm trying to make a quantum computer that processes relativistic information, uh, I like to, we have to think about you know how something how information can propagate relativistically, and one way to think about that is uh, you know under the constraints that it's a you know it it, it behaves light like or something like that where the information is going to be spread out because of course information can travel at the speed of light that's you know nobody would doubt that so yeah so there is this idea that information is going to propagate you know as light would propagate so you have to try to rectify what Haugen's principle means for that type of propagation of information. So let's get into it a little bit as to um, why this is a relevant thing, where does it come from. Let's pause the music for now and then we'll bring that back uh, after the discussion. So let's head to the board. Uh, and I am back. Welcome, welcome. And you came just in time because we're going to be talking about Huygens, Huygens principle. There we go. Haugen's principle. Haugen's principle. Now, this is just a little video, short video, to talk about Haugen's principle and how it shows up in <laughs> the Huggies principle. <laughs> That's that thing that states that no matter what, when you run out of diapers, it's going to be at 8 o'clock at night. <laughs> and you have to go to the store. And the, cl <laughs> the closest store is closed. Yep, you got to drive 20 minutes or at least 20 minutes to the 24-hour Walmart or Wegmans. Oh, so again, so this is just this one series. This will go up on YouTube afterwards. Always feel free to ask me questions. I'm pacing around the room. I can see chat, and I would love to answer any questions that anybody has along the way. This is one of the benefits of being here live and being in person is you get to ask me stuff, and I get to answer to you in real time. So um, that's nice, right? I think, maybe. And if I don't know something, I can probably point you into a resource that might be able to answer your question if I can't. So also exclamation mark notes in the chat and you can find the notes today. We are in, if you click the, the link, we're in the odds and ends. Um, so anyways, I'm just going to read it, the, what Haugen's uh, principle is and then you can follow along in the notes. It's under the odds and ends folders. Uh, and then um, I'm not going to write it all out because that just seems silly. But then we're going to start drawing some pictures and those images that get skewed up, I will redraw those as we go so you can see what they look like or are supposed to look like. Um, but the first thing about Hagen's principle is all points on a wave front serve as point sources of spherical secondary wavelets after the um, after time Delta T, that's supposed to say delta T. After time delta T, oh, it does on your notes. <laughs> I forgot I changed that. Um, after time delta T, the uh, new position of the wavefront will be uh, that of a new surface tangent to these secondary wavelets. So what does that look like? So if we have a wavefront, okay, which basically just means a bunch of, well, a wavefront. So I, I, everywhere along the wavefront, Every single point along the wave front can act as a secondary source of more circular waves. Spherical waves, excuse me. In three dimensions, spherical waves. And what does that mean? Well, that means that they will all have, you know, spherical waves that propagate like this. And you can already start to see that we're going to be having some possible interference patterns and we'll talk about the, those. I think the, the fun thing about the Haugen's principle and the thing you learn about in introductory physics, which is the thing I'm going to emphasize today, is that you can use Haugen's principles to understand um, <clears throat> diffraction patterns, diffraction, not interference patterns, but diffraction patterns, diffraction patterns, as well as uh, reflective um, properties of light, such as Snell's law, which is how we're going to end today. So. Um, Notice what happens here, though, is as the spherical waves propagate away from these, second, these points along this wave front, we get a, another wave front that shows up along the edges. Now, as, as I have stated, every single point will have this spherical phenomenon 
um, and or the spherical wave propagation. So this wave front will exist right here, and then the sources on this will repeat. You know, you can treat this just like another wave front with every point along this wave front being another source of propagation for a new spherical wave. Anyways, so this is it. So again, uh, so all points on this wave front will serve as point sources for more spherical waves. And, um, and then the waves will continue to add together as they propagate through the surface and whatnot. But um, so that, where does this show up? And I think that that's the more important thing, the more exciting thing, is where does this show up? Uh, and it shows up in single slit diffraction. Single slit diffraction. Many of you know a lot about double slit um, interference because of the whole double slit experiment and all. That's like a very popular thing for um, quantum mechanics and whatnot. But many of you don't know, or I mean, maybe you learned it in physics and either remember or forgot, that actually it, light will diffract and you'll have an interference pattern based off of a, um, even off of a single slit, okay? So how does that work? How do we talk about that in physics? So let's start by having, actually I need to make it a bigger slit as I draw these different pictures and probably also start over here. So as we look at a beam of light, so we're going to have a beam of light coming in, right? And we'll have a wave front that shows up right here along the slit, okay? So in red, we have some wall. Maybe I can, you know, or some slit. Maybe I'll make it bigger just so it's easier to see. And then in between that, we can have a wave front, okay? Now, um, so at, along this wave front, each point along the wave front will act as a point source for radial propagating wave to form, okay? Now we're going to give the, the slit a length of A, okay? As one might do. And, um, and then we can just, you know, just like we did with Huygens' principle, we can, you know, develop wave fronts. Now we can talk about what happens at just this point moving forward. So if we were to talk about a vector that points away from this point source, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. We can find wave fronts all along that line, okay? And when we do that line, when we do those wave fronts along that line, we can evaluate the, the sum, you know, and there's going to be a wall some distance away. And we can talk about, well, what's the angle that it makes with the horizontal. So the angle that it makes, this vector would make with the horizontal is just going to be what? Well, theta is equal to zero, right? It makes no angle with the horizontal, okay? But what if we were to say, okay, so what if we consider a different vector through these spherical waves, right? Because they're spherical waves, so we imagine that they propagate in every which direction. So we can imagine what way we could consider light going in a different direction. So. Let's um, redraw our slit here like this. And let's have our point sources that act, you know, that will act as let our points that act as point sources. And now let's say, okay, let's consider something that looks like this, okay? With different vectors going up like this. Okay? Now let's say between this point and this point, right. Mm, I don't know, let's just say right here, I guess. We'll say this is A over 2, so this is not drawn to a good scale. <laughs> but we'll just say that that's A over 2. Okay, distance away, A over 2. I am Dodo, good to see you. Welcome, welcome on in. Been a long time, how are you? Okay, so then, <clears throat> um, so now let's consider again this angle that it makes with the horizontal, okay? And let's label our vector. So we're going to have this vector be blue, and we'll label it 2. And this vector will also be, well, let's have a different one. Let's do green, I guess. And this vector will be 1. Now, let's imagine that the wall is far away. So let's not have the wall this close, or else it's hard to see what I'm talking about here. <laughs> so let's pretend the wall is far away. And if the wall is far away, we can imagine that they're going to hit roughly at the same spot. I think that's kind of like one of the things. Okay? 
We can at least say that if the wall's far away, then the angle that these would make with the horizontal, so this would be theta, right? And this would be theta as well. <clears throat> but the angle that they make with the horizontal is close enough that we can say they're approximately the same thing. And then they could still hit the same point at some wall very far away, right? That's not crazy to think up, okay? So they're going to hit at some point some, some point, some very far distance away at the same point. And these thetas are going to be slightly off, but they'll be close enough so that we can just say they're approximately equal. Okay? <clears throat> so what does this mean? Well, we can also say that they're relatively the same length, except they're not. Right? There's a bit of a difference between their length because they're going different distances. Um, so can we talk about that length? Well, sure we can. Right? If we have this point going up to meet point 1, then we could draw another vector or another, um, let's see here. Red is probably OK. I don't think I have orange anywhere. Do I have orange? I do have orange. Let's try some orange. If it comes down and meets this line at a perpendicular angle, like this, da -da, da -da, then we get a right triangle that exists like this, OK? Jeez. Um, and then what we have here is two vectors that will be equal length. Okay? New follower, reverse causality. Love the name. Welcome, welcome. <clears throat> it's almost like antiparticles, right? Okay, anyways, um, so then we have this distance right here, which is really the difference between R1 minus R2, and we'll just call that delta R12. Okay? Great. So now we have two vectors of the same length, same angle, and now we can talk about the difference between those two vectors. Okay? That's important. Why is it important? Um, a person who understood my name. <laughs> yes, I do study. Uh, I studied particle physics, so it does. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Not very well, though, but I get it. Okay, let's do... Um, <sighs> Let's do, what is that? Oh, that's the wall. <laughs> We're going to erase the wall. <clears throat> now, the, um, we can talk about this distance uh, from one thing, right? We can talk about this distance from using trigonometry, is what I should have said, from trigonometry. Now, this angle right here is special. This angle also happens to be theta, which is very helpful. Why is it very helpful? Because it's also the angle that this makes with the horizontal. So now we can use this right triangle to uh, set up a relationship. Namely, it's going to be delta r12, which is equal to <clears throat> a over 2 sine theta 1. We'll call it theta 1, and you'll see why in a, in a little bit. But theta 1, which is equal to lambda over 2. Now, that lambda over 2 is very odd. Okay. By the way, if you are just getting here and you want to watch Admiral, thank you for being here. And again, thank you for the sub. Welcome. It's good to be back, so it's, I'm glad to see you again. So, um, yeah, this will be on YouTube if you're interested. Like, Halligan's Principle is pretty awesome. But if you are new here or if you are just joining us now, the, um, I'm talking about Halligan's Principle, and the notes for this are on uh, the, Google, the shared Google Drive exclamation mark notes in chat for those. Okay. Now, um, the lambda over 2 is kind of important, right? It plays a very significant role in this system, right? If this distance, a over 2, um, which a over 2 shows up anywhere along the slit, right? Because the slit is a distance apart. So there's always going to be one dot here with another dot some a over 2 distance away from it. And what the lambda over 2 means is that these two vectors, OK, if the difference between the two vectors is lambda over 2, then one of them is behind by a half of a phase. OK? Well, by a phase angle of <clears throat> enough to make them exactly out of phase, I guess I should have said. So let's, um, so now these two vectors are exactly out of phase. So what happens there? Well, that means that the, be, they become destructive and they interfere destructively. <clears throat> Um, and then that, so that's just what destructive interference is on a single slit diffraction. So again, we are not doing a double slit di diffraction. Like you've seen all of the, the fun. Oh, luckily it did not break much. Poor Hagoromo. I'm so sorry. Anyways, um, 
Yeah, you've seen all the double slit experiments where they have the water going through the two openings and the piece of wood and stuff, and then the waves are interacting, and they're like, okay, you can obviously see where the peaks and the troughs are meeting and stuff. Great. But like many people just don't realize that a single slit has that same effect, okay? It's more dramatic in the fact that like the, the peak in the center is going to be very, very bright, and the, you know, the, the fringes around it, the dark fringes are going to be very, you know, hard to see unless the, slant, the, the slit is very, very small in comparison to the beam of light, yada, yada. But um, nevertheless, this is a, a phenomenon that shows up. And you can see it plain as day. So now let's, um, let's see if we can, so we can use uh, Haugen's principle to talk about what might happen if we were to, instead of considering the distance between two points of A over 2, what happens if we consider point A over 4? And we're going to do our same formula here, right? So now we'll have something new happen and we'll do a over 4. We repeat the process. Notice how you can simplify this by just multiplying both sides by 2 and you'll get something like a sine theta 1 over lambda 2. So now imagine if we did a over 4 sine theta 2 is equal to lambda over 2. Again, we're looking for this lambda over 2 because we want these waves to be out of phase. Cobalt, good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Um, so now we're looking for lambda over 2 because we want these waves to be out of phase. Again, destructive interference. And if they are, uh, so how does this turn out? And this is going to be equal to a sine lambda over 2, which is equal to 2 lambda. Th sine theta, excuse me, theta 2 is equal to, yeah, 2 lambda. Maybe I said that right. Maybe it's Maybelline. Um, and now you can see a pattern here, right? Every time we introduce this another distance away between these different parts of, of the um, points along this path. Now remember, the, like I said, the points exist everywhere. This is the beauty of Haugen's principle. These points exist everywhere along this wavefront. So any distance away, we can formulate a new variable, and then we end up with the general form for a diffraction pattern, which is a sine theta n is equal to n lambda, okay? where we can find the wavelength based off of the slit for any of the fringes. More like lambda. <laughs> Come on, cry. Come on. OK. So now, then, uh, so then we have our general condition for destructive interference based off of a single slit. OK, but now let's talk more about what this refractive property is. <clears throat> let's talk about refraction. Let's leave up Huygens stuff. Let's leave up this, I guess, and let's get rid of this. Again, if you are behind exclamation mark notes. Uh, also, if you're following along on YouTube, I probably should have said this earlier, the notes are in the dis description. Um, OK, great. So. Refraction. So we did single slit defraction. Now it's time for refraction. <clears throat> That's after you fract once. You fract again. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> OK. Um, let's draw the surface down here. And we'll make a nice big picture. I guess I want a lot of room for this. OK. So this is going to be the surface. This separates our one medium from our other medium. So on the top we have, um, <coughs> um, so on the top we have one medium. Call it whatever you want. Call it air. Call it water. Call it um, silicon. Who cares? And on the bottom we have another material. Again, who cares what it is? Doesn't matter. So now we can imagine sending a bunch of lights in the same guise as this, right? A bunch of you know, not a bunch of lights, a single light coming down like this and hitting across the surface of this. And along this way, we'll have our wave fronts showing up along the way. Now, what happens after we get to the surface? Well, there's obviously going to be some diffraction. We all know that. How does this diffraction look? Well, once it hits, you know, obviously the angle will change. Sorry. <laughs> obviously the angle will change. This chalk, I broke it. I guess I must have cracked it or something. I said I'm sorry, Hagaromo. I said I was sorry. 
And then the wave fronts are going to follow the same step type of changing, right? It's going to come down here, hit this, and then it's going to refract. Okay. And it wants to hit, I guess basically the idea is that the wave front should be perpendicular. Because they're tangent to the spherical waves, so they should be perpendicular to all of the um, all of the, you know, ooh, 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 something like that. Yeah. So they should be perpendicular to all of the um, spherical waves because it's going to be tangent to those spherical waves, and they're going to be showing up on the source of the <coughs> of the wave front. Now, let's get some trigonometry going on. And here we'll have a. Let's say that there's going to be a angle. So this we're going to call something, let's call it lambda 1. It's not very good. Then we're going to have this as our angle theta 1. Theta 1. Is, this my, is my picture going to work? I don't know if my picture is going to work. No, my picture is not going to work. I have to draw another wave front in a different spot, in a different location. Hold on. Where did my eraser go? <clears throat> the wave front has to be hitting this. And obviously, wave fronts exist everywhere along these lines. So it's not that there wouldn't be a wave front there, but I need another wave front closer, um, namely right here. <clears throat> and then going like this, something like that, yeah. OK, why? Because I need to talk about this angle right here. We'll call it theta 2. And we'll call this wavelength 2. OK. <clears throat> so now you can see that there's a difference. Well, I don't want to give away too much spoilers yet, OK? But you can start to see. I can zoom in a little bit on that. And like I said, once I get these, uh, I will fix these. Uh, you see off in the right. Once I get these notes fixed, um, then you should be able to uh, go take a look at these images more clearly. Okay? Formatting in LaTeX, right? <laughs> First world physics PhD person problems. <clears throat> now, these triangles are significant, though. Again, right? We can kind of talk about them in just a second. But before we get to them, let's talk about the. Uh, what doesn't change about light? I think that's the, the key, one of the important things about this. When you have light beams going from one medium to another medium, what does not change? Now, there's a couple properties that each light has, each, you know, there's a couple properties that light has. And one thing that does not change is frequency. Frequency will not change from medium to medium. Wavelength will change as well as the wave fronts, so the um, velocity will change. Um, well, not, maybe not the wave fronts, but the velocity of the light will change. And, but frequency will not. And frequency can be related to velocity and wavelength like this. So now we can say the frequency of the light does not change. So the velocity in the medium, there is a velocity outside the medium divided by the wavelength outside the medium. The velocity inside the medium divided by the wavelength inside the medium are all equal. Okay, Mandry, thank you so much for the sub. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. 18 months. Math. Well, there's pictures. I mean, pictures are fun, right? Hey, for pictures. Um, <clears throat> Puzzle Gamer, good to see you. Do you also get constructive interference? So in the diffraction thing, you do also get constructive interference. The, um, the difference between the two is just a factor of one half of the wavelength. Um, then they're in phase, right? Then the waves are in phase, and you get constructive interference. I don't remember the formula off the top of my head. And how does that affect anything? I don't remember. <laughs> Um, but you do also get some constructive interference. And the other thing I didn't really mention about the diffraction thing that I, I could have is that the distance of the slit matters a lot. 
So like it, we call the slit of distance of A. The smaller A you get, the larger the diffraction pattern shows up. And then the larger the slit gets, you know, the smaller the diffraction pattern gets to all the way up until the whole beam of light is now just shining directly through. So, um, you know, there's going to be some restrictions on how small your slit needs to be in order for this diffraction pattern to show up. If you're using like a laser, then obviously this diffraction pattern is not going to be nearly as like, uh, you know, the diffraction pattern won't even show up if the slit is too big. It's just going to, the laser's just going to shine through the slit like it doesn't even interact with anything. So there's other things that I didn't talk deeply about that are important. But the goal I just want to get across is how does this Huygens effect show up in these two phenomenons. Um, so now, again, at each, so we're back to the refracting thing. Um, but now we, like, we want to talk about angles. And that's the reason why I drew these triangles in the first place is because we want to talk about how the angles are going to be with the horizontal and the verticals uh, as the beam of light hits the wall. And these wave fronts that exist along the surface of the spherical, or tangent to the spherical waves, are the thing that's finishing the circles. So here we have a right angle, right? I told you that the, um, that the wave front is going to be perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Same thing with this one down here. So we have two right angles. And the beauty is they share this distance as a hypotenuse. We'll call that length L. Okay? So they share that distance. <clears throat> and that distance becomes... So we can rewrite the... We can reformulate trig functions that look like this. Sine of theta 1 is equal to lambda 1 over L. Sine of theta 2 is equal to lambda 2 over L. Now we have a nice, wait, so we can divide the two. I guess we could divide the two. Let's do that. Sine, one, sine of theta 1 divided by sine of theta 2 is equal to lambda 1 divided by lambda 2, because the L's will cancel. We already have a relationship for lambda 1 and lambda 2. The relationship looks like this, lambda 1 over um, lambda 2 is equal to V1 over V2. So now we can rewrite this as V1 over V2. And now we have another important task, which is to talk about a relationship of velocities inside of mediums and outside of mediums, i.e. vacuum. Right? The speed of light in a vacuum, everybody knows that. It's C. C equals 1. <laughs> but the speed of light inside of a vacuum is not. Right? Um, there's interactions happening that slow it down. Right, via the, the phase velocity versus the group velocity, that whole shtick, right? The, velocity, the speed of light inside the medium is still C, it's still the speed of light, but then once you consider the whole light being propagating through the medium, it propagates at a slower speed, right? Because it's interacting, it's bouncing off of stuff. So the group velocity, I think it's group velocity, right? That's the one that changes. That old, yeah, that old thing. Okay, and um, so let's see here. So now we need to define a relationship between the speed of light in a vacuum and the speed of light in a medium. And the thing that we all know that as is the index of refraction, which is the speed of light over the velocity inside of a, inside of a medium. So for this material, or this system, where we have two, two mediums, um, we get something that looks like this. This is going to be equal to the speed of light divided by the index of the refraction of 1, divided by the speed of light divided by the index of refraction 2, or simplified to the index of refraction of 2 divided by the index of refraction of the first medium. Now we can rewrite this as the famous Snell's law. <clears throat> n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. Now again, how did Huygens' principle come into play here? Well, we needed these wave fronts to complete the triangles, right? These wave fronts are a thing. They have to be perpendicular to the direction of propagation because we know that at any single point along any one of these paths, there is a point, namely something that exists like right here, that will give off a spherical wave. <clears throat> Anywhere along this wave front, there'll be a spherical wave given off, and the front line of those spherical waves will form another wave front. Okay? Um, this is one of the things. So then how do I relate something like, so this is the, I should say, this is the Snell's law um, 
Now, how do I relate this to what I study on a regular basis? Not very directly. <laughs> but I do study, uh, so I study relative, you know, the relativist quantum computing. And what we're interested in is how does information propagate through a medium? And there is, you know, in quantum mechanics, everything is waves, right? And so if you apply information to a field and let it propagate somewhere, then you can imagine that that propagation exists under these constraints, right? It exists under these constraints. So it's good and all for like, you know, understanding something like light, where we're not really too concerned about everything, especially about like lasers and stuff. Because like if you were to send out a, a beam of light, you could just capture that beam of light and then measure the, enough of the intensity, as long as you're close enough away, but enough of the intensity where the errors are negligible and the information can pretty much get there without being destroyed or dismantled or anything like that. But now imagine if you have a light bulb, okay? Right? A light bulb. A light bulb radiates light in every which way. And along every point of radiation exists a number, you know, of points, an infinite number of points that also exhibit spherical radiation, okay? So as you can imagine, if you encode information onto the light that is propagating away from a light bulb, where do you have to be in order to receive that information? And that's a very difficult question to answer. You have to be along and everywhere along the light cone itself. Um, and that's, you know, something that's not attainable. So is there, you know, so the goal that people ask and people have been asking in relative quantum, quantum information is how do we take information like that where, you know, you have information propagating away too quickly and how do you capture enough of that so that you can encode information onto a field, send it from somewhere to another one, somewhere, send it from one place to another place and then take all that information off while it's doing this phenomenon. And that's a question that we still have to answer and still have to figure out. It's a very complicated question and requires a lot of, ma many people have worked on it, many people continue to work on it. And I, you know, and I'm working on it with my advisor and we have different ways of thinking about it and stuff that, um, well, we'll you know, will maybe be pr profitable and maybe won't be. <laughs> but the knowledge, the knowledge is profitable. What's Dutch? It's a pronounced like guide. So it is Huygens. It is Huygens then.